10. The church that could not because it would not. Let's pray. Father, anoint your people with eyes to see and ears to hear and anoint your servant with your word as we empty ourselves now a vessel for your use and yield to your Holy Spirit. In your name we pray. And the saints said in agreement, Amen. Satan, we bind you, all territorial spirits, all principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness, wicked spirits in high places, territorial spirits, elemental spirits, strong man spirits on assignment, all above, around, in the, and below the strong man spirit. We are loosed, you are cast out, and the saints said in agreement, Amen. Father, I ask that you anoint your people with eyes to see or ears to hear. And as you anoint me now with your word to contend for the faith, I ask that you create in every person here and in every person listening to this videotape an open heart and an open mind for your truths, Lord, that you would put upon them the seven spirits of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of the fear of the Lord, the spirits of wisdom, revelation, knowledge, understanding, and good counsel, to minister the truths to them of what you are about to speak through me as I empty myself a vessel for your use and yield now to your Holy Spirit to divinely possess me as you bring forth your word through me. May they hear your word and receive and believe to your glory, Lord. We pray in your name. The saints said in agreement, amen. Glory to God. We continue our discussion. The church that could not because it would not. The church that could not preach the fullness of the truth of the Word of God because it would not receive the fullness of the truth of the Word of God, which is a testimony of the prophetic verse of Scripture in the New Testament that says, in the last day the apostasy will come. The apostasy is the falling away of the church from uh, walking in the fullness of truth to walking in error. Doctrines of men, doctrines of demons, traditions of men, all warned against in Scripture by Paul. Yet we see it today. And so, in this series, uh, which is uh, something God has called us to preach to assist the church in returning to the truth of the Word as it was originally given, we come now to the point where we discuss uh, in uh, more of the false doctrines that the church teaches, which are not true. We come now to the point of studying so-called hell doctrine, the doctrine of hell and eternal damnation, which has traditionally been with the church from the year, uh, about the year 400 A.D. to the present, but which originally was not part of church teaching, historically documented, archaeologically documented, and scripturally documented, and I will touch upon all of those uh, today to prove it to you. And then I will show you 36 proofs that hell is a pagan doctrine brought into the Christian church by unruly theologians of the early church, and that it is a doctrine of men, that there is no such words in the original Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, such as eternal torment, eternal damnation, everlasting punishment, eternal destruction. They simply do not exist. They are all figments of theological imaginations with some scripture twisting and meaning twisting of words that the words themselves are not warranted to hold or to be used in that manner. And so I will go through a very extensive uh, uh, teaching to demonstrate to you these truths that the church is in error when it teaches such things and that such things the character of God in the heart of the Father. 
So Satan, creeping into the church, using such doctrines, gets believers to malign God's heart and to malign his reputation and to malign his character and to lead people into error. So Satan gets the uninformed church to be his tool. And that's pretty sad. That's very sad. And what it shows is how far the church has strayed. Why? Because the scripture says that the Holy Spirit is on the earth to lead us into all truth. Then why is the church apostate? The word apostate means to be in error. How can the church be apostate in the end time? Well, the answer is one, it's a prophetic sign. All prophecy must come true. The second point is because it has the Holy Spirit tuned out and it has been chasing after doctrines of men since 400 A.D. And I will demonstrate these things to you and give you the historical background. And I invite you to go out and check it out yourself. You can do that in libraries. You can do it on the Internet. It's all there in black and white. I have nothing to gain by saying these things. It certainly does not endear people to me. But that won't be the first time. <laughs> you know, and, and when I teach such things as this, uh, it makes people m mad and angry. And uh, it offends them. That's okay. God offends the mind to expose the heart. Huh? Okay? To show people where their hearts are really at. See? Some people insist that there must be eternal damnation and torment because in their heart they want to see the wicked and they want to see the sinful roast and toast forever. That's their heart, which means they need an examination of heart first because that's not the heart of God, as I will teach you uh, in a short while. So let's examine this stuff. And let's just see why these things are not true. And I ask you to just prayerfully ask the Holy Spirit to confirm the truths of what I am going to show you, and I believe that He will. And it will change your life, and it will deepen your relationship with the Lord Christ and the Father. Our proof text today is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14 and 15. which says that henceforth we be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ. The first thing I want to do is to remind you that we are at war. Amen. In Ephesians 6, Paul says, Our struggle is not against the flesh. Our struggle is against principalities and powers, rulers of the darkness, wicked spirits in high places. That means that the Christian is in warfare against Satan, against lying spirits, against religious spirits. And if you are not doing the warfare and you are not contending for the faith once given, then you are in error and you are part of the apostasy, part of the fallen away church. All of us that have been there needed self-examination and repentance, including myself. And if we have taught false doctrines such as eternal damnation, eternal torment, hell doctrine to our people, we need to repent and ask their forgiveness, as I did to my congregation when I came into higher knowledge because it's a prophetic sign of the end time that in the last days knowledge will increase. So the Holy Spirit is increasing knowledge for the purpose 
of restoring and renewing the church. Which is why Scripture says when the Son of Man returns, will He find faith in the earth? Well, that's King James. The actual Greek, the literal Greek doesn't say that. The literal Greek says when the Son of Man returns, will He find the faith in the earth? Now that's a completely different story, isn't it? The faith refers to the original doctrine of Christ that the early church was grounded in and which the early church preached. And I will submit to you and prove to you that the early church never preached hell, never preached eternal damnation, never preached everlasting judgment or punishment. These are fallacies and they were introduced to the Christian faith through the Roman Catholic Church around the year 400 by a Roman Catholic theologian named Augustine who admitted, by the way, and it is historically documented that he admitted that he felt the need to teach that was to get unruly people who were subjects of the Roman Emperor to behave and to conduct themselves in a more moral manner, to try to keep them from sinning by putting fear into them, that they would lose their salvation. Because you see, the Roman church taught that they're outside of the church, that is the Roman church, there is no salvation. So their salvation became dependent on the church and uh, its teachings, and that was one of its teachings, hell and damnation. Now it should be evident to you that if you are a mature Christian, you know that salvation is not dependent on any church. Salvation is dependent on a saint, and his name is Jesus. Huh? Amen. Amen. Okay? So, we are at war. Now the scripture says, the kingdom suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. That's what I'm doing here today. I'm contending for the faith to take back the church from Satan by force, one person at a time. I don't care if you are listening and you believe what I'm going to tell you or you don't believe what I'm going to tell you because the Holy Spirit will bring you to belief in time. Amen. That's His work, not mine. I'm just a mouthpiece of God. Hmm? And he calls me to do this, and I do it because I am faithful and obedient to his calling and to his purpose by his grace alone. Now, having said that, let me just qualify something. When the, when the church speaks, or when the scripture speaks of violence, the kingdom suffers violence, and the violent take it by force, does that mean physical violence? No. It means spiritual violence, doesn't it? Okay? And what is spiritual violence? It's contending for the faith using words. Quoting scripture. Standing on the word of God. It's not physical violence at all. It has nothing to do with governments of the world. Or anything like that. It has to do with the spiritual warfare with Satan. And so we learn from all of this that God's purpose is to make us to see and understand that there are truths which have been lost through the work of unruly theologians who were not disciplined enough to translate the word according to the laws of language but instead translated according to their doctrinal upbringings and expectations. And in the process led millions of people over 1,400 years astray into false doctrines and false beliefs. But we have the spirit of truth to bring us on track. Praise God. Huh? Amen. And so Amen. that's why we teach this series, the church that could not because it would not. The church that could not
preach the fullness of the truth of the Word of God because it would not receive the fullness of the truth. It was more interested in perpetuating doctrines of men with a little help from demons Amen. and religious spirits. Mm -hmm. That's the nature of the warfare. Okay? So let me just start by telling you that the doctrine of hell and eternal damnation is a doctrine which is contrary to God's will and to His nature. The proof of that is in Jeremiah chapter 32. Would you turn to Jeremiah chapter 32? And this will be our jumping off point for the proofs that I will give you today and show you that when people talk about hell and their hell experiences, they are being ministered to by a religious spirit. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of this stuff on television. Okay? People who have a ex personal experience of hell, etc. You can't have a personal experience of something that does not exist. Ho oh, ho. Am I in the right church? And I will prove to you that it is a confabulation of men's thinking. The proof text of what I am saying is Jeremiah chapter 32. And read with me, if you will, from verse 32 to 35. And this is what it says. Because of all the evil of the children of Israel and of the children of Judah which they have done to provoke me to anger, they, their kings, their princes, their priests, and their prophets, and the men of Judah, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and they have turned unto me the back and not the face. Though I taught them, rising up early and teaching them, yet they have not hearkened to receive instruction. But they set their abominations in the house, which is called by my name, to defile it. And they built the high places of Baal, which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom. Now watch this. To cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire unto Moloch, which I commanded them not, neither came it into my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. Here, God very clearly establishes his position about people being put in fire or being passed through fire. And if it is true of the valley of Hinnom, it is true of hell. Because in hell, people are put in fire and passed through fire eternally, forever and ever. Notice here that God said, I did not command them to do it, neither did it ever enter my mind. The idea of putting people in fire and torment forever and ever has never entered God's mind. That's a matter of Scripture, folks. That one verse alone dispels the whole doctrine of hell. That one verse alone. Now notice the verse before it. Okay? Listen to what he says. But they, but they set their abominations in the house, that is the house of Israel, which is called by my name to defile it. Now let me tell you something. The church is the house of God. Israel was an embryonic type of the early church. That's why God refers to it as the house. Notice what God says. That with such abominable thinking, you defile my sanctuary. You defile my house. Dear God, help us. No wonder Jesus called us sheep. You know what it is about sheep that make them sheep? They're dumb. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
So here, very clearly, in Jeremiah 32, verse 34 and 35, God was telling Israel, and remember, this is Old Testament type. Huh? Old Testament types have New Testament realities. Okay? And whenever you see a truth in the New Testament, you must find the seed of that truth in the Old Testament in the form of a type. Amen. Amen. Okay? Now that's very interesting, right? Because the New Testament, as it is written, talks about hell, 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 damnation, eternal torment, and it's completely absent from the Old Testament. There is no seed in the Old Testament. People say, well, how about the word Sheol? Which means hell. The word Sheol does not mean hell. It's also translated in the Old Testament as the grave. The word Sheol does not mean the grave. The word Sheol means the unseen or the unperceived, and it refers to the death state after the physical body dies. And in the Old Testament, the death state was applicable to both the uh, righteous and the unrighteous dead. It applied to both of them. As a matter of fact, the idea of eternal damnation and a judgment in the afterlife was foreign to the rabbis. It was a foreign concept to the Jewish mind of the Old Testament because the Jews believed only in death and resurrection and nothing else. And when it came to judgment, it was their rightful understanding that God judged them for their sin in the here and now. And that is exactly what the Old Testament Scripture demonstrates. Now notice in Jeremiah 32, verse 34, it says, They set their abomination in the house, which is called by my name to defile it. What is that? Putting people in fire. Causing their sons and daughters to pass through the fire unto Moloch, which I commanded them not. Neither came it into my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. Neither came it into my mind to do this abomination. The Lord himself is saying that when you put people in fire, it is number one, a sacrifice to another god, Moloch. And number two, it is an abomination to him. Yet the church will teach that if we put, if the Lord puts people in fire eternally, that that's divine justice. Yeah. I can't think of a concept more repulsive. Not to say anything about the stupidity of it. Because it maligns the heart of God. Okay? And what it says is that God never thought of putting people in fire, but in the judgment, all who are wicked or evil, instead of being corrected and healed and loved and restored and forgiven, are put in fire to roast and toast forever. So God violates his own uh, ideas, his own scripture, his own beliefs, his own teachings. Does that make sense to you? I think there's something wrong with the church. <clears throat> now let me give you God's position. Hosea 13, 14. If Sheol is the grave, or, or I mean the death state, rather, rather than hell. Okay? Notice what he says in Hosea 13, 14, when the word grave here is Sheol in the Hebrew. 
I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O oh, death, I will be your plague. O so grave, I will be your destruction. Repentance shall be hid from mine eyes. Now that's interesting, isn't it? Okay? Now, what if we don't use the word grave there and these theologians who, tra who translate the word Sheol as hell is applied here? Let's apply their own doctrine and say that Sheol here means hell. Okay? And they say hell is eternal and forever and ever. Well, if I read Hosea 13, 14, according to their teaching and translation, then it reads, I will ransom them from the power of hell. I will redeem them. <laughs> so I guess we can use their own doctrines and their own teachings to disprove their own uh, translations and demonstrate clearly that what they are translating it for or as is error. I think that's pretty clear. Now what about this death state that the Old Testament is talking about? Sheol. Hades in the New Testament is its equivalent. And we will go into the meanings of the words that are translated as hell and what they really should be translated as uh, according uh, to the Word of God, not according to what men say. See, theology is what men say God says. Okay, we're not interested in theology. We want revelation directly from God's Spirit through the Word. Rhema revelation. Okay? Scripture says, you have no need that any man teach you. You have no need that I'd be standing here teaching you this. If I were not here and you went to God, God would teach you this. If you've never met me, you've, met, you've missed nothing. If you've never met Christ, you've missed everything. Huh? Amen, amen. See? And so, we will go into that and I will show you that moment, uh, momentarily. But I want to say to you now that there are those out there, religionists, who insist that hell doctrine is true. There are those out there that insist that the translations are true. Okay? In fact, they will be among the first in their self-righteousness and spiritual arrogance to come after you and to write uh, bad things about you and your teaching. They'll do it on the internet. They'll do it on the radio. I mean, if you ever survey some of the things that are said about Benny Hinn and Kenneth Copeland and some of the others on the internet, Jesse Duplantis and things like that, the most atrocious uh, criticisms by legalistic Christians who think they know it all Amen. and are so quick and willing to get the log out of uh, or, or the splinter out of uh, the eyes of these men of God before they will get the log out of their own. Okay? Such spiritual arrogance, such spiritual presumption, I call them the spirit police. And the internet is just filled with the spirit police. Okay? They have not a clue of what the true doctrines of the word are in the Hebrew and the Greek. Okay? But they're among the first to shoot off their mouths to criticize those who contend for the faith. Why? Religious spirits, that's why. It's a spiritual warfare. You see, mm -hmm. religious spirits, okay? They give themselves over to religious spirits and become the very tools of Satan used to divide the church and they think they're doing God a great work and a great justice and there isn't an ounce of love in anything they write. Amen. 
How many have been there and seen that? Raise your hands. Look at that. Thank you, Jesus. Now watch this. Aerial bombers coming over. Oh, God. <laughs> God <forbid. laughs> we don't receive that. Yeah. 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 We are going by the blood. We're yes, covered we by the blood. They're yeah. visible to the enemies of our soul. There you go. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Now, hell is forever, they say. Hell is eternal damnation and eternal torment. Well, one of the terms for Sheol in the Old Testament, with that is the death state or the unseen or the unperceived, is captivity captive. That's where the Old Testament dead were kept because Christ had not yet come to redeem anybody. And it says that Christ ascended on high and then he went to captivity captive. Now listen to what it says. In Psalm 68, 18. You have ascended on high. You have led captivity captive. You have received gifts for men. Yes, for the rebellious also. That the Lord God might dwell among them. That is the believers and the unbelievers. That's the heart of the Father. Wherefore he says, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now he, now that he ascended, what is it? But that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. That he descended is the same also that ascended up far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. How about that? Ephesians 4.10 and 4 9. That he might fill all things. That it is God's intention to fill all. May I tell you that if you go into the literal Greek, the word things is not there. It's that he might fill all. So much for the hell doctrine. So much for the hell doctrine. Now, let us consider this. Having given you those three proof scriptures, let me give you some food for thought. <coughs> Number one, it is apparent that all New Testament truths have a seed in Old Testament time. If hell, as so frequently discussed, in the New Testament translations are correct translations, then why is hell not mentioned in the Old Testament? Where is the type? Where is the seed? Where is the reality of it in the Old Testament? The truth, it does not exist. The word Sheol translated by the King James translators in the Old Testament 31 times as hell and 31 times as the grave are both errors of translation. It means neither hell nor the grave. It means the unseen or the unperceived, the death state. That's all it means. It doesn't mean anything beyond that. But the death state. The same can be uh, applied to the word Hades, which is used nine times in the New Testament. How do you know, Bernard? I counted them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Another example. Gehenna. Translated as hell. Twelve times in the New Testament. Is mentioned, I think, two times in the Old Testament. And both times Gehenna is mentioned in the Old Testament. It is translated the valley of Hinnom. If it's hell in the New Testament, how come it's not translated hell in the Old Testament? How convenient. And the reason is because Gehenna does not mean hell. See, it violates the laws of language. 
The word Gehenna means the Valley of Hinnom, which was on the southeast corner of Jerusalem and was the garbage dump of the city of Jerusalem. When Jesus spoke to, of Gehenna, he was speaking to Jews, he was speaking in Jerusalem, and they all knew what Gehenna was. It was the garbage dump. where everything left over and useless was piled on to be burned. In typology, it represented the lake of fire. But in reality, Gehenna can never be translated hell because Gehenna is a proper noun. And proper nouns are names of things, and names of things do not need translation. Praise your Period. <laughs> That's so Proper nouns and our names of things require no translation. Amen. Amen, amen. Zero translation. Yeah. So how you take 12 verses of scripture and turn the name of a city dump into hell is beyond me. So, the first principle is, we find no type of hell in, or seed of doctrine of hell in the Old Testament. It simply doesn't exist. We discovered that Jeremiah 32, 35 says, God never conceived in his mind of putting people in fire. Never. And he said that the house of Israel doing that was a defilement. When you bring that doctrine into the church, you are defiling the church. My God, help us. Now watch this. If there is a hell, why did God not warn about it from the beginning of Genesis through to the end of Revelation? Wouldn't it be so important to drive home to every believer and non-believer the warning that they are in danger. You would think that God would want to talk about it over and over and over again to drive the message home to them. Huh? Right. Yet, where do you see it? Where do you see it? Not mentioned. If hell were real, if there is a hell, why did God say in Genesis, the day that you eat of the fruit of that tree, you will surely die. And not the day that you eat of the fruit of that tree, you will surely go to hell. Mm -hmm. And in the New Testament, why did God say, the wages of sin is death? Rather than not warn, the wages of sin is everlasting punishment in hell. Yeah. No, he said the wages of sin is death. Mm -hmm. And by the way, he later said, death, where is your sting? Mm -hmm. huh? <laughs> if there is a hell, why was God against the Israelites putting their children through the fire to Moloch? You see, the concept of people burning in fire whether it's on the earth or whether it is eternal. And by the way, that all came from pagan religions. Okay? Particularly from the Greek, the Egyptian, and the Persian religion of Zoroastrianism. They all believed in a eternal damnation with the torment of the wicked in fire and flames forever and ever continually burning in agony. So the question then becomes, if you believe that hell is real, are you not honoring the pagan doctrine? Are you not honoring the god Moloch? 
I believe you are. I don't know about you, but I will have no part in that. Huh? My God is bigger and greater and more loving. See, the problem with the church is that the church believes that God is omniscient. He's all-knowing. The church believes that God is omnipotent, all-powerful. But the God, but the church, the church does not believe that God is all-loving, omnibenevolent. Ah, that's the problem with the church. See? And the scripture says God is love. How do you put that one together? Huh? Churches that believe God is all-powerful, omnipotent, all-knowing, omniscient, but they don't believe He's all-loving, omnibenevolent. I have news for you. That's sick. In any man's language. Now watch this. So if God in Jeremiah 32 told Israel not to put people in fire, that's an abomination to him, that he never ever thought of such a thing, that's his position, okay? And then we teach that he puts people in fire eternally for their sin. Does God have a double standard? That's the next question. Because if you believe he does, then he has a double standard. Okay? And you malign the character and the heart of God. If there is a hell, why would God give the believer the revelation of a place of torment, flames, and eternal pain for the wicked dead through pagan beliefs and traditions? from which it first rose to begin with. Why would God use pagans and pagan mystery religions to bring such a so-called truth into the Judeo-Christian faith? Why not just tell the believers as he gave revelation through the prophets and the apostles? Let me ask you this. What apostle do you know in the New Testament that preached hell doctrine? None. What prophet do you know in the Old Testament that preached hell doctrine? Zero. None. Someone turns and say, oh, but wait a minute. Paul warned about eternal destruction. The word destruction is mistranslated as is the word eternal. And he never spoke of hell as a place of eternal torment in any of his epistles conspicuously missing. <clears throat> if there is a hell, and Gehenna means hell in the New Testament, why isn't it translated that way in the Old Testament where it's used? The answer? Because it doesn't mean hell. That's why. If there is a hell, why did Jesus himself not preach about it or mention it in the New Testament? Now our religious friends, the spirit police, will turn around and they will say to you, oh yes, he spoke of hell over and over and over again in the Gospel of Matthew. That's the word Gehenna. The word Gehenna doesn't mean hell. Oh, well, there's some verses where he used Hades. Hades doesn't mean hell. Well, there was one verse uh, where he spoke of Tartarus. There are no humans or mankind in Tartarus. There are only fallen angels in Tartarus. And there's only one verse referring to that. And it refers to a place in the death state reserved for fallen angels, not man. So tell me, where in the New Testament did Jesus speak about hell? Reality 
Jesus never spoke about hell to anybody. Zero times. Paul never spoke about hell to anybody. Zero times. The Old Testament never spoke of hell at all. Zero times. The New Testament original Greek manuscripts never speak of eternal damnation, eternal torment, everlasting judgment, or everlasting punishment. Zero times. When you see those things translated as such in your Bibles, every one of those phrases are translational errors. And in our coming sessions, I will take you through them one by one and show that to you and show you why they are translational errors. Okay? If there is a hell, why did not Paul mention it in any of his epistles? When Paul used the word destruction, the literal meaning of that word uh, in the uh, Greek meant suffering a loss or ruin. In other words, that word, apolumi, never refers, according to Vine, in Vine's expository dictionary, that word, to destroy, or to experience destruction, never means destruction of the person's being. Vine says it means destruction of the person's well-being. Okay? The ruin of his faith walk, in other words. He's got to be pieced back together. Now watch this. Let me see if I can find this. Paul states that he has preached the full counsel of God. How can Paul make such a statement that he has preached the full counsel of God if there is no record in the book of Acts, a history of the early church, of hell or damnation being preached by Paul or any other apostle. And there is no such evidence in Paul's writings or epistles anywhere in the New Testament. Yet Paul says he has preached the full counsel of God. If hell were real, then Paul missed preaching the full counsel of God. Hmm? But guess what? He didn't, because hell is not real. It's a figment of theological imaginations, and its purpose is to control the masses. Amen. As a matter of fact, I would be so bold as to submit <coughs> for your consideration the fact that it is spiritual terrorism. Amen. <laughs> amen, amen. Sure, why not? Okay? It terrorizes people. Satan has used this doctrine and used Christians to promote this doctrine to drive people away from the church, to drive people away from Christ, to drive people away from accepting the gospel. Amen. That's exactly Okay? 
through making them spiritual terrorists, scaring the bejesus out of everybody in the process, okay? with a bunch of pseudo-spiritual claptrap. <laughs> My goodness. So Satan, through deception and lies, uses the church against the church. That's the nature of the warfare. Hmm. Many of you worry, will my loved one make it? Where is my grandpa today? Whatever happened to my grandma? Where is great Aunt Tilly today? I want to know. She owes me some money. No. <laughs> okay. Where are my great grandparents today? Where are my ancestors today? See? Yes, some theologians, doesn't matter if they're Catholic or Protestant or non-denominational, they can't tell you. And the reason they can't tell you is because they don't know the gospel. Is it not a sad thing that most of the church does not know or understand that in the New Testament there are two distinct gospels of salvation? Matthew 25, verse 46. The Gospel of Augustine, a man. Narrow is the gate that leads to eternal life, and broad is the gate that leads to eternal destruction. Did Jesus say that? Yes. But the words are scripture twisted. The translational assignments of meanings are wrong. Broad is the gate that leads to destruction. Would make you imply eternal damnation. Okay? There's our friend, that Greek word, apolumi, to destroy, but it means to destroy not the person's being, which would be eternal damnation, but the person's well-being, their faith walk, their relationship with God. Amen. See, it has completely different connotations when you use the appropriate meanings to translate. And then there's the true gospel. 1 Timothy 4.10 Jesus Christ, the Savior of all, especially those who believe. Let me ask you something, Mr. Pastor, Mr. Theologian, Mr. Evangelist. Which gospel do you preach? is a true doctrine and the book of Acts is a history of the early church and its ministry why is it that in all the sermons of the book of Acts in all the preachings of the book of Acts there is no preaching on hell and damnation there is no preaching of the early church on hell and damnation How is it that something so important to man's welfare would be totally eliminated from the book of Acts, which is a history of the early church and its teachings? If there is a hell, how can Scripture speak of the gathering of all into Christ? Ephesians 1.10. How can all be gathered into Christ? If some go on to eternal damnation, only some can be gathered into Christ. Huh? If there is a hell, how can...
can Christ subdue all things under his feet? 1 Corinthians 15, 28. He can only subdue some things under his feet. If there is a hell, how can Christ be all in all? 1 Corinthians 15 and 28. That, that last verse, I gave you the wrong scripture reference. How can Christ be all in all? If there is a hell, Christ can only be all in some. Then the rest go on to roast and toast. If there is a hell, how can Christ make all new? Revelations 21.5. He can make only some new. If there is a hell, how can Christ draw all unto himself? If hell is eternal, he can only draw some unto himself. If there is a hell, how can Christ make all beautiful in his time? He can only make some beautiful in his time. If there is a hell, how can Christ have all men to be saved? 1 Timothy 2, verse 3 to 6. He can only have some men to be saved. If there is a hell, how can Christ be Savior of all? 1 Timothy 4, 10. He can only be Savior of some. If there is a hell, how can all be made alive in Christ? 1 Corinthians 15, I think it's 56 if I remember right, or 55. Only some can be made alive in Christ. If there is a hell, how does one call eternal damnation for sins committed during a finite period of time on earth God's justice? Do you get it? In other words, people consigned to uh, the pit of hell burning forever and ever. How can you call that God's justice when all of the sins that they committed were in a certain period of, in limited period of time? What's so just about that? If you call that God's justice and that God needs forever and ever to burn and punish the sins that they committed during a period of time on earth, then at what point in forever and ever is God's justice satisfied? And if God's justice is satisfied at some point in forever and ever, then why does forever and ever have to go on? How about thinking of that? If there is a hell, how does it reflect upon the honor in the heart of the Father? Particularly when in Jeremiah 32, the Father said, I never thought of such a thing. If there is a hell, how can you say that the justice of God requires it rather than a perfect sacrifice provided by a Savior? Think about that one. If there is a hell, and all things are for God's pleasure, Revelations 4.11. How does God derive pleasure from seeing people's roast and toast in flames forever? Think about that. If there is a hell, 
Why would God consign to it every man, woman, and child who passed through earthly existence without ever knowing or hearing of Christ, nor having received his salvation? Would it be their fault, particularly since Jesus said in Scripture, no man can come to me unless he be called by the Father? The only way that they could have passed through existence without receiving Christ is because the Father did not call them in this existence. And yet the church teaches that because they did not receive Christ, they are in hell. Every man, woman, and child who never heard of or received Christ. That's another abominable false doctrine of the end time church. Doctrinal foolishness. Doctrines of men with a little help from demons. See, the problem with the fallen away church is that it could not, and I don't say this to be critical, I just say this to drive the point home, okay? It cannot discern itself out of a big paper bag. And that's the truth. Most Christians don't even know what a demon is. Wouldn't recognize a demon if it was standing in front of them with the word stamped on its forehead. Say. Because of spiritual blindness. Getting tired of me? No, another hour. Mm -hmm. If there is a hell, how does the threat of entering an eternal torture chamber cause you to love God more or draw close to Him? In such an instance, does not the motive to love Him become fear rather than love? That's right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You think God wants you to love Him through fear? Mm -hmm. Or do you think God wants you to love Him through love because of who he is. Amen. If there is a hell, how do you resolve the idea that it would be far worse than any of Hitler's concentration camps? And the church calls this God's love and justice. If hell existed, it would be far worse than what Hitler ever did to Jews and Christians. Far worse. You're saying that God is worse than Hitler. Think about that. If there is a hell, why would God put the lost there forever and ever and never forgive them when he instructs us in Scripture to forgive 70 times 7, which means infinitely? Hmm? <laughs> no answers. If there is a hell, and God created it as part of his creation, why would he have created man knowing that more would not be saved than saved and would be tortured forever and ever for his pleasure? Would this not make God out to be cruel? In other words, he'd know if hell were part of his creation and he created all men, then you know that the greater part of them would go on to eternal damnation and eternal torment because he knows all things. Mm -hmm. Why would he go ahead and create them anyway and subject them to that? Wouldn't that be cruel? Is God cruel? May it never be. If there is a hell, how do you reconcile this with the scripture that says God is love? 
Is not burning people forever and ever in flames torture rather than love? Call it what it is, torture. If there is a hell, why would it be necessary to pray for all to be saved, as Scripture commands, if the fate of the vast majority of men is sealed in confinement to eternal damnation anyway? Does that make sense? If there is a hell, why is the Greek word for the lake of fire and brimstone the word theon, which means God or divine spirit or Holy Spirit? Why does Paul say in Hebrews 12, 29, our God is a consuming fire? And why does the Bible refer to the Holy Spirit as the spirit of life? How then can the lake of fire be the final place of eternal damnation of the wicked dead rather than the place of their corrective chastisement, restoration, healing, and deliverance? And yet the church teaches that the lake of fire is their final place for eternal torment and damnation. Attributing the ministry of Satan, kill, steal, destroy, John 10, 10, to the Holy Spirit, which comes within the hairline of blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, if it were not for the fact that it's ignorance rather than willful. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is always willful. If there is a hell, then how can people be sent there forever and ever if God is the Savior of all? 1 Timothy 4.10 Is he the Savior who failed? 1 Timothy 2.5 says he gave, he gave himself a ransom for all. Did his ransom fail? <laughs> Hebrews 10.10 10 says that he sacrificed once for the all. Did his sacrifice fail? The church preaches it does. It did. If there is a hell, and men are judged and condemned to it forever, then the free gift of salvation, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, was withheld from some and given to others, which is contradictory to Scripture, which says that God is not a respecter of persons. That is, what he does for one, he does for all. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, it is by grace through faith that you are saved, and that not of your own, not of your own self-effort. It is the free gift of God, not of works, not of performance so that no man can boast. You see, there's only one way people can get into hell if it ever existed, and that would be that they could not perform well enough for God and could not be acceptable enough for Him. And if that were the truth, then their salvation was lost because of their performance, and performance is works, not grace. Amen. Hmm. How about that? In other words, it's God who does the saving, not man. If there is a hell, and the wicked or unsaved dead are consigned to it, then God becomes the God who failed, the God who said that he was Savior of the world, the God who said that he is Savior of all men, but just couldn't do it, the God who said he would, but couldn't. This in turn would imply that God was too impotent or uncaring to save all, or just would not love enough or care enough to save all. If hell is real, then God's grace is incompatible with it, which in turn would mean that God's grace is for some but not all, which in turn makes God to appear capricious. 
my brothers and sisters, in the introduction today of this part of our teaching on hell doctrine and the fallacy of hell doctrine, I have presented to you 37 proofs through using proof scriptures that hell cannot be compatible with doctrine of the Christian faith. The entire Christian scripture speaks against it because it is contrary to the heart of the Father. It is contrary to scripture itself. It, can, it uh, contradicts all the tenets of the doctrine of salvation and all the tenets of the Bible itself revealing to man the heart of the Father. The apostate church can preach such doctrinal filth only because of its lack of understanding of the love of the Father, which is to look beyond the sin to see the need and which is to love people to life. And by the way, that's how you got saved, if you don't believe God does that. He looked beyond your sin to see your need. And he called you to the Lord Christ Jesus. That is not the same thing as performance, is it? It should become apparent through historical and scriptural research then that the hell doctrine is pagan in origin, entered the church through unruly early theologians who wanted to promote religion and the dependence of the people on them and the church for their salvation or for money making. They sold indulgences at that time. That such doctrine exists today in the church because of careless or inattentive scholarship of theologians, Bible scholars, and religionists who insist on making God in their image and likeness, despite the overwhelming evidence that such doctrine maligns the character of God, and despite the fact that Scripture overwhelmingly contradicts it. We see then that hell doctrine is a confabulation of the minds of men. The work of theologians and religionists, with some assistance by Satan and his religious spirits, who by promulgating such doctrinal filth cause believers in the church who promote such doctrinal filth to malign the heart of God and undermine the purpose and the plan of God for mankind. This in turn permits Satan to use Christians in the church to become the very weapons against Christ, Amen. the Father and the Holy Spirit and maligning their character and intent. Every Christian needs to meditate on these truths and repent before God for ever teaching such doctrinal filth and unholy trash and abominations. And repent before God for the proper place of these doctrines is not in the church, but in the Gehenna fire pile. Amen? Amen. 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 Father, we give you thanks, praise, and glory for the revelations that you have brought forth through your scripture. We thank you, Father, that you have clearly demonstrated to us through scripture and proper translation that the Bible has been tampered with. The Bible has been tampered with by men through religious spirits. The Bible has been diluted down purposely to lead people into error. The written word. That this is deception. That the Bible that the Bible has been rewritten by men, not according to the laws of language, 
but according to their doctrinal upbringings and their doctrinal expectations. That the church itself has been deceived. causing many to suffer and worry and become mentally tormented over ideas that their fate or the fate of their loved ones may be other than the fullness of salvation and life in Christ in the world to come. Father, may you heal all of such demonic atrocities Amen. and doctrines of men, Lord God. And may you bring the fullness of the, of the truth to an ailing church worldwide, Lord. May you use us in power and might to help restore the gospel, the true gospel of Christ, to a dying church, Amen. Amen. a dying earthly Amen. church. Amen. Amen. And may you raise up the remnant church in power to continue Amen. your purpose to your glory. May they all learn the true gospel of Christ, that you are the Savior of all men, 1 Timothy 4.10 that you draw all unto you. That it is not your will that any perish, but that all men be saved and that you will have your will. Praise you, Jesus. Praise. That you will fill all men, as the scripture says, not some men. That you will be all in all. 1 Corinthians 15, 28. That you will make all new in your time. That you make all beautiful. That you have gone to the dead and preached to the dead your gospel, captivity captive, and escorted them to paradise. Amen. And that you continue to do so and continue to preach to the dead. 1 Peter 4, 6. For this cause is the gospel preached to the dead, that they may be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. Amen. That you are in absolute sovereign control through your sovereign love of your creation, and that you will fail no one, because you are the God that never fails. Amen. May these things be to your glory, Lord Christ. Amen. And to your glory alone we pray. And we give you all the thanks, praise, and glory. The saints said in agreement. Amen. 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 Give God the glory.